Hello everyone, how's it going? My name is Azrin, the language nerd. I'm the owner of the Calgary Language Nerds and welcome to this video on how to learn another language. I would appreciate it if you checked out the services that my business offers. We teach a wide variety of foreign languages and we're really good at what we do. There are very few tutoring businesses or tutors that can look you in the eye and say, if you work with us, you have a very good chance, a very good chance of achieving the fluency goals that you have. We are committed to helping you achieve your fluency goals and we take on some accountability on that. I find a lot of tutoring schools, tutoring businesses or language schools, they have their levels and they teach their program, they teach their curriculum and they go level by level, they do their thing, but by no means is anybody saying, hey, if you work with us, we're going to do everything in our power to have work with you to help you achieve your fluency goals. Usually they're not saying that. And that's something that we try to do. We do our absolute best and we're pretty darn good at what we do. Our prices are pretty fairly priced, I think. I mean, we're not the cheapest on the market, but considering the quality of the service we're offering, I think it would be suspicious and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make any sense to be the cheapest on the market, but we're very good at what we do. And the prices are at least the reasonable, at least, at least the way I view it. So if you are looking to learn a language, I would appreciate it if you looked into our services. As I said, we're very good at what we do. And ultimately taking a class, or purchasing one of our workbooks, or heck, even just leaving a donation is the absolute least I ask, the smallest thing I ask to support my team and I uh, in this course that I put together that it's completely free. So that's a very easy way for you to support us. Now, let's jump into our course today. <clears throat> let's go over here, share my screen. Boom. Today is the introduction of level four. The goal of level four is to get you to such a point that you have professional fluency in your target language, as you can see at the top here. What does professional fluen fluency mean, you might ask? Well, professional fluency means that you are strong enough in the language that if you were to go get a job in the language, you would be able to function at that job. You could go to meetings, you could have professional conversations, you could have casual conversations and go hang out with your coworkers afterwards and make friends. It means that when you're in the interview, you're not going to be perfect at the language, but when you're in the job interview, the person interviewing you does not have any major issues understanding you, nor do you have any major issues understanding them. And your employer feels confident that, okay, even though it's not their first language, I feel confident hiring this person and bringing them onto the team. There's not going to be any language issues here. So you're by no means completely bilingual, that's going to happen more like level five and level six. You're not completely bilingual, but you really are strong in the language. If you are familiar with the common European framework of reference, which is a one way to score language fluency or to judge language fluency, judge, is that the right word? Measure, that's the right word. The common European framework of reference is one common way to measure language fluency. Ultimately, the end of level four is getting you somewhere around a B2. It's going to depend on how you use this program and if you've skipped anything and truly how well you know the concepts, but somewhere close to a B2 is what you should have by the time you complete level four. That's just to give you a bit of an idea. And so today I'd just like to introduce you to what you will find in, in this course here, in, in this uh, course, in this level here. Overview. So we're going to talk about a new learning technique and a few reminders. There's something that's new in level four that you have not seen in any of the levels so far. Number two, this is really useful. We're going to talk about common, gra common uh, grammatical grammar points or grammatical points. Now that I'm actually reading this out loud to myself again, I'm not sure if we say grammar points or grammatical points. I'm gonna stick with grammar points for now. Common grammar points in many languages. This is gonna be very useful for you. I have done some research and I've been, I've tried to make the most comprehensive list that I can of common grammar points you see across most world languages. I think I've done a pretty good job. I might've missed one or two. I might've missed certain things, of course, because of so many languages on this planet. But my goal with this thing, with this here is that you can start to look at these points and you can say, oh, my language has cases. Oh, my language has that. Oh, I don't really know how to do that. Hmm okay, I think I need to dive more into it. So that's my goal with this. And I think it'll be quite useful for many of you. Number three, and this is where we start to get into the, I suppose the meat and potatoes, the meat of this program here. We're gonna jump into tourism essentials. 
this will be a lighter topic, I think, a little bit lighter, a little bit easier. We'll talk about using public transportation, taking a taxi at the airport, visiting the doctor, um, bargaining. These are the major topics we will, we will cover off. Oh, by the way, before we move on, it's funny because it's funny how I personally, when making my program, I decided to put tourism essentials in level four, which is a reasonably high level versus many other language programs or many language learning resources tend to put a lot of those tourism essentials pretty close to the beginning of the program. I don't necessarily think that's wrong. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I suppose the reason I put it in level four was because, is because I find that when you, when you put a lot of these, these essentials in the early phases, in the beginning phases, you don't have a very strong grasp of the language and you end up simply trying to memorize these as phrases or as words, and they don't properly stick into your mind. And therefore, when you're actually traveling, even though you studied those concepts, for example, using public transportation, you're not able to apply it once you arrive in the, in the country that speaks the language that you're trying to learn. In addition, what tends to happen with these things is people will often learn certain phrases or words or expressions or even some role play dialogues. And what happens is that they can start the conversation, meaning you're at the airport and you're trying to figure out what gate to go to or something like that. And you can go ask someone, hey, I'm looking for gate five, but I can't find it. You know how to say that, but then you cannot understand the person's reply. <laughs> and so it didn't really help you. I remember I lost my, my, my suitcase was lost when I went to, uh, to Beijing the second time. Was it the second time? No, I'm sorry, the first time. And I had learned about a fair amount of tourist tourism phrases and words and, and, and role plays and such, but everything went out the window. I couldn't remember it on the spot and it, I couldn't do it. I was so stressed and it wasn't, I, could, I just couldn't do it. And it was completely useless. I had a similar experience when I lived with a homestay family and I had studied, hello, how are you? Oh, nice to meet you. Very, very basics that I could definitely use, but pff, they went completely out the window or I could kind of get them out of my mouth, but the, they didn't understand. I didn't understand the reply. And I may as well have known zero Mandarin, even though I'd taken like eight months of classes at the time. Eight months, is that right? Yeah, something like that. Eight months of classes approximately. And so I decided to put it on here because I think these things, now that you have a good foundation in the language, it won't be too challenging for you to start to learn these. And when you learn them, I believe they're going to stick into your mind. And when you try to use these these, these concepts, these ideas, right here, taking a taxi and such, when you start to use this language, you'll have a better chance of understanding the person's reply now that you have that foundation. So that's why I decided to put it into this level four and not earlier on, even though in many, probably most, maybe even all of the programs, this is something you find earlier on more in the beginner phases. Anyway, let's keep moving forward. Then we're going to go to TV and movies. We're gonna talk about some general vocabulary We'll look at sci-fi and fantasy vocabulary, and not just vocabulary, of course, but let's say vocab, um, vocab, a, we'll do some listening practice, some reading practice, etc. Action adventure, and of course, horror. You might be looking at this list and you might be thinking to yourself, Azrin, you've missed out some different genres, like comedy's not there, drama's not there, uh, romance is not there. Well, the reason I didn't is because comedy, romance, drama, even a thriller, maybe, um, you know, these types of, uh, these types of genres are generally more, they use more day-to-day -day language, and there's nothing specific often in those, in those kinds of TV and movie genres, and if, and you actually might even already have a, be able to understand a percentage, a pretty good percentage, maybe 50%, 40% of what's being said when you're watching something that is a, maybe not a comedy, comedy is really hard, but you know, a drama, for example, or romance, chick flick. Is that a thing, chick flicks? Is that what they call those? Or is, are they called rom-coms now? I forget what they're called. You might already be able to understand a lot of those. But when it comes to sci-fi, fantasy, oof, there's a lot of words that you're not gonna know. You're not going to. Action, adventure, there's a lot you're not going to know. You're not going to know how to say rescue someone or shoot a gun 
or take cover, you're not going to know how to say those things. You just won't. Horror, like monsters and ghosts, these are not things you're going to know. You won't know how to say them. And hey, everyone wants to be able to watch TV and movies, right? So this, these are the ones I've chosen. Of course, you can go above, above and beyond. And that's going to be a big piece of this, actually, which we'll get to in a moment, going above and beyond. You'll see what I mean. Number five is news. So when you start to get to that professional level of fluency, um, some of these news topics become incredibly important. So I'll give you an example. If you were to go take, I'm actually helping someone right now prepare for a B2 test. And pff, is it the whole test? Essentially, the whole test falls within most these topics here. Everything on the test falls into basically these topics. There are other things too, but this is the bulk of it. Weather, probably not so much actually, but entertainment, arts, culture, eh, sports, maybe not actually, sports, maybe not. So any of these more serious topics, entertainment, arts, culture, business, finance, economics, health and medicine, possibly, you know, politics. Another one that could be thrown in is education, but we already did a lot of education. These kinds of topics, these news topics are often what you'd even find when you take a formal level test, right? So these are pretty important here and we're, you're going to get lots of practice with them. Number six, you're going to talk about expressing and defending your opinion. That's important when you start to have that B2 professional sort of level. I think about in a workplace, you often have to express yourself very clearly. You often have to defend yourself politely, right? Sometimes you're in a meeting and you're trying to stand up for yourself and really propose an idea. Or maybe you have to clearly give a presentation and outline, hey, I'm submitting this proposal to lead an expansion into Mexico for the business or whatever it is, right? This is an, a, a very important uh, piece here. And also a lot of, I can't say all, but a lot of, um, well, let's say for French and Spanish, uh, other languages too. Let's say for many languages, not all, of course, but many languages, if you ever, if you were to ever take a, a level test, a formal level test, there, there probably will be something of this regard, something related to this topic on the test, where you have to express and defend your opinion in some way, shape or form. And then lastly, this is going to be arguably the most important, we're going to have a choose your own topics section at the end. That's going to be a big one. Because ultimately, one of the goals for me today, not today, but in this course here, in this level four, is to help, is to move you forward to becoming, to learning independently. I want you to grow some wings and start flying on your own, in a sense. That's going to be very important. And hopefully, if you've been following this program to level four, my, my hope is that you've, you've, you have develop some skills in terms of how to learn a language that you can now apply on your own. And so I'm going to encourage that and then at the tail end of level four. Heck, you can even bounce around it. You might even choose to start there, many of you actually, possibly. Now, as I said, there's something new in level four that was not in level one, two, and three. Or yeah, level one, two, or three, that's true. So each unit level two and three specifically was divided into four sections, vocabulary, writing, speaking, and listening. Level one was a bit different because it was a slightly structured a bit differently, but regardless, level two and three was vocabulary, writing, speaking, listening. Well, level four is going to have those two, but there's also going to be a reading section for every single unit or most of the units. My general rule of thumb for reading, I've written it at the bottom here, read what you can as often as you can, dot, 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 if you want to. So not everyone's going to necessarily want to do lots of reading, not necessarily. And that's okay. That's not the end of the world if you're not going to read books and things of that nature, because not everyone's necessarily a reader. And maybe your priority is just to be able to speak and listen and converse, and that's your biggest priority. And that's perfectly okay. I will tell you that once you get past, you know, let's just say that the further you move through this program, the more reading and writing actually does start to become a priority. It does start to become a priority. It does be start to become something that you should be doing some more of, that you would need to do more of to actually progress. Because at the end of the day, here's the thing, when you start to get like to level five, level six, like really to those levels where you're truly bilingual, how do I even say this? 
I suppose a certain level of reading and writing and actual study is kind of needed in a way. Because the way that you acquired the level of fluency you have in English required study. You had to study science in school to know your science terms. You wouldn't know what chemical reactions are and photosynthesis. And you wouldn't know what, uh, what's that other one called? Uh, chlorophyll in the leaves. You wouldn't know that if you didn't go to science class. You wouldn't know how to say plus and minus and algebra and trigonometry if you didn't go to math class. You wouldn't know how to say, for example, well, here's one, it's actually, you wouldn't know, for instance, how to write an essay if you didn't go to English, like a language arts class. You wouldn't know how that works. You wouldn't know what a thesis statement is. You wouldn't know what a metaphor is. You just wouldn't know. You wouldn't be able to do it. You had to study in order to achieve the fluency of English that you have now. And of course, you may not use words like metaphor and photosynthesis on a day-to-day -day basis, but they're in your head and you know what they mean. And that's important. Just because you don't use a word or a phrase or whatnot doesn't mean that you don't know it. It's in your head. And the challenge for a lot of language learners, once they get past once they start to get to this B2 level and above, this professional level fluency and such, is you have to expand your passive vocabulary. You have to have these words in your head that the native speakers have that they never use, but when they hear it, they know what it means. And if you don't have those words, when you watch TV and movies and stuff, the native speakers understand, but you don't understand because they're using these words that you just don't, you just don't know, but they all know because they studied at school, they grew up with it, right? And so that's why and that ties back to reading and writing and, and some formal, sometimes formal study, because sometimes you have to go do a little bit of formal study once you start to get more advanced. Uh, it's just a reality. The other thing you'll see, and this is really more in five and six, but I'll mention it now and give you a preview. The other thing that happens as you get more and more advanced is you have to get very narrow with your topics, that you have to get very narrow with what you study. I had a conversation with my, with my, my Spanish student today, and she was telling me about a dental appointment. And we're talking in Spanish. I'm very strong in Spanish. And I had to look up so many words because she's like, oh yeah, they, uh, because I had an abscess in my tooth. And I was like, she's like, how do you say that? And I was like, I, I haven't used or heard the word abscess in like two years, but I know it. I was like, I don't know. And she's like, yeah, they have to like, they have to like clean it really well. Then they stick in like a freezing. How do you say freezing? I was like, uh, I don't know. I just don't use that word in Spanish, right? And then she's like, yeah, you know, because I had lots of root canals. And I was like, root canal, how the hell do you say that? Like, how do you say that? I don't know how to say that. Like, and then there was fillings and, and um, uh, wisdom teeth we talked about. And, oh, Lord, uh, what do you call those? Grinding your teeth, we ended up talking about. These are all very technical, very, in, in a very narrow, these are all terms in a very narrow topic, a very specific topic that in all reality, even in English, how many times do I say grinding my teeth in a year? Like eight? Like, I don't know, not often. How many times do I talk about fillings? Well, probably I talk about fillings once a year, roughly around when I go to the dentist. That's when those top conversations come up. We don't use these every day, but once you get to those advanced levels, that's what you're lacking. So people often at those, once they get to this upper intermediate level, they feel stuck. They're like, well, how do I keep improving? Well, the way to keep improving is you have to get very specific in what you learn. Even though you might be like, when will I ever use that? Well, the reality is you'll probably use it once a year, two times a year, four times a year, but that's all that's left for you. All these specific topics. And because there's 150 specific topics, when you don't know those 150 specific topics, you get stuck when you try to communicate. There's 150 topics that each have 20 words related to them. That's what is that? 600 words that are each used four times a year, but those all compile, they add up, right? So anyway, I forgot how I got on that tangent, but it's important. Now, what to read? I've given you some options here. Graded readers. Graded readers are basically texts that are written based on, they're written at your level. So they write a story or a text or an article or something, but they rate it at your level. So simply go into Google and search graded readers for French, graded readers for Spanish, graded readers for Turkish, graded readers for Swedish. You'll find it if it's a widely spoken language. If it's a more rare language, you're going to have a harder time and that might not be an option for you, which is why I've made this course for more widely spoken languages. 
bilingual readers are similar. Bilingual readers is when you have a book, for example, one page is in French, the next page is, is the same page, but in English. So you can read one line in French, look over, read one line in English, and you can compare and compare when you don't understand. You also have uh, posts by other content creators. You might be thinking, what does that mean? Well, for example, in Gujarati, I used to only read memes on Instagram. I would just read memes. That's what I used to read. And that's how I've developed a lot of my reading skill in Gujarati. Now I can actually read longer texts and such. I don't have a, as big of an issue, but initially just memes with like eight words on it. That's all I used to read. And really I wouldn't even read all the words. I would read one or two letters because that's all I could really do. And my brain would get so tired. Song lyrics, right? You can read song lyrics. You can read stories. You can read books. The ultimate thing is you, have, you just have to read. What you read is what you read. You have to just start reading. So I've given reading activities and exercises in this, in this um, program here. But at the end of the day, the goal, all I'm saying is you've got to read, right? Reading will help you a lot in terms of vocabulary. And it will help you progress. Even if you don't necessarily love it, doing a little bit of reading will help. I don't read, I mean, that's not true. I read a fair amount when I learn languages, but not by choice. I do it by, I just take a lot of classes. So people make me read things I don't want to read, but I'm telling you, it helps me. It helps. Um, let's get into some important reminders before we start level four. Um, these are things we've talked about in the introduction, but this is going to be very, very important as we go into level four. So first of all, remember that you have to do the following at the end of each unit. You must do this, right? List one or two grammar points you learned. Write a short paragraph explaining each one and provide at least four example sentences that incorporate each grammar point. It'll help things be solidified in your mind. List out all new words and phrases you learned. Highlight five to 10 that you wanna make an extra effort to remember. Fantastic. List out any concepts you skipped or didn't fully understand that you will revisit later. And list two plus things, uh, two plus other things you learned that are standing out. This is at the end of each unit you do this, okay? And lastly, I think you need to do this right now. Do you feel ready to move on to level four? Right. Do you feel ready to move on? At the end of each unit, you have to ask yourself that. Each step, each unit, you have to ask yourself, do I feel ready to move on to the next chunk here? Do I feel ready? Am I ready for this? Am I ready to move forward? If you're not, you shouldn't move forward yet. Like, go deeper into the previous topics. Like when you're in science technology, like which is, I think, one or two topics ago, spend more time on it. Do more speaking practice on it. Read more articles on it. Listen to more videos on it, right? Learn more vocabulary. Do more practice. Review your notes. Do some more writing practice. Redo some of the activities. So this is very important because we're getting into some harder concepts in level four. Uh, this gets very important in level four. Be inquisitive and curious. You need to really do this in level four, level five, level six because now you're getting to a point, level four, not quite as much. Well, let's say more level five and six, but level four is where it starts, where the types of things you have to now fix in order, and, and that's not true. The types of things you have to do in order to progress are a little bit more picky and specific. It's like one grammar mistake you keep making that's very minor and, and isn't a big deal, but everyone still understands what you say. Well, to become very fluent, you might have to fix that little mistake. The only way to do that is to actually ask yourself, am I saying that right? And ask other native speakers, did I say that right? Or is there a better way to say that? And pay close attention to other people. Like, how are they speaking? Oh, I don't talk that way. Why don't I use that expression? Hmm. Often, you know, you're going to notice some knowledge gaps or grammatical gaps that need to be addressed and need to be learned. You have to go figure, figure that out. And, you know, I, this is, this is something I said before, right? Having a curious nature matters at every stage, but here it really matters level three onward. And now we're in level four, every level moving forward, this matters more and more and more. So be like this curious panda in the bottom right corner. And that gets us to our reminder on learning grammar effectively, right? How do you learn grammar? Well, there's lots of ways to learn grammar. Of course there are, but this is a very effective way that will work. If you already have your own system, that's great, but this will work for the vast majority of people. Step one, you have to expose yourself to it organically. Hopefully at this point in time, you have exposed yourself to all sorts of things organically, hopefully. So when you learn something grammatical, hopefully if all has gone well, when you learn something new grammatically, it's not that you've heard someone say something 
or you've read something and you're like, oh, I've heard that before. I just didn't know what it really meant. Or like, I've been, I've been saying that, but I don't know how and why, but I know it's just right because I've been told. I did that for the French subjunctive, for example, like that's what happened to me. And then like that, or, or you need that organic exposure first. Um, if you watch the uh, lesson, the lesson demos for Japanese on, on my website, as are in the language nerd.com slash free course, there's some lesson demos. You'll notice this for Japanese, like for the particles in Japanese, like wa and wo, for example, I haven't studied them formally, but I have a good intuitive understanding of how they work. So then when I do step two, learn the theory, the theory becomes the glue to help it all stick together and truly in, get become internalized and truly understand it. Um, you might complete some worksheets and quizzes to, to deepen that knowledge after you've done step two. I would encourage you to create your own sentences, both spoken and written, that use that grammar point. Um, if, if you're still struggling, keep paying attention to how native speakers use this grammar point in question in their natural speech. Keep paying close attention and make a note like, oh, he used that phrase again. Oh, that, or that grammar point again, right? Oh, that's how, oh, interesting. That's the kind of sentence I can now use. Okay, let me write that down on my phone quickly before I forget. Right, step six, make a special effort to use that grammar point when you're conversing and writing to really help it sink in. And ultimately, if you're still stuck, you may just need to, you may need to default and just, you may need to just do this yellow point at the bottom here. Just memorize some useful phrases that use a grammar point one at a time. And eventually you'll put the pieces of the puzzle together. When you learn, just memorize one phrase at a time. You're like, I don't know why I say this, but that's just what I say. And then with time, you're going to start to see the connection of why you say it. I've had to do that before myself. With things that are really complex, sometimes that's your only recourse. And that's going to get to us next time. We're going to jump into this here, which are common grammar points in many languages. This is going to be a big one for many of you. I've done a lot of research on this to break down, like, what are the most common grammar things, grammar points you're going to see in most world languages? So this is going to be a big one that'll be helpful, especially for those grammar nuts out there. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you for watching. I appreciate, I hope you enjoyed this video here. Hope it was helpful. I think it was a bit longer than usual. So hopefully that's okay with you. And I will see you later. Bye for now.